I will tell you first something about us. This is our company, and we do beekeeping, and the main purpose of our beekeeping is therapy. We bring clients to the hive, they open the hive, everyone is afraid of bees, they overcome the fear, and we use it for therapy. So that's the main purpose. And I'll talk about it more later. So first of all, how I started. I started beekeeping nine years ago. And the reason I started was kind of funny because I always look at it as a child and I always say this is this could be interesting. Because if you go back old times in Europe, beekeeping was not trade, it was art. It was really they look at it more like art form. And every king at the castle, they have a beekeepers. Uh, if you are priest at the village, you are not priest if you don't have bee beehives in your backyard. You are not a doctor if you don't have a beehives. And you are not a teacher. This was These professions were really tied with beekeeping. And it was almost like a social status. Uh, so I was interested. But I lived in Canada, and we had a backyard. And I'm like, oh, no, that's not going to work. One day, I watched a movie, and it was some European crazy movie, and there is this dysfunctional family, and the guy gets upset, they live in the apartment, they have a little balcony, and he gets on the apartment, he puts on veil, and he has a hive on the, on the, on the balcony. And it's this multiple, like, hundred apartments. So I'm like, boy, if he can do it, and I can do it. So I did as every backyard beekeeper starts. I contacted everything I can, and I found out, that's easy, you just buy this equipment and you buy the package of bees. And so I did, so I bought the equipment, and I found the beekeepers are fun guys, but they don't really, the mentorship is not really so easy to come by. I mean, they do know what they are doing, but they are kind of weird. They kind of tell you, and they speak different language. It's almost like, okay, I get it. And so I got the hive, I got the package of the bees, I went through the drama, shaking 10,000 bees in the hive, first time in my life, which, by the way, if you ever do that, you don't have to do that, there are other ways to do it. And bees did it. Really great first year, everything was amazing, and in spring they died. Like, okay, well, I don't give up, so I bought two packages next year, and another equipment set up the hives, they did great, and they died. Well, to go ahead, I said, okay, I have to change something, so I did. And now, I, basically what I did, I work with commercial beekeepers. I, I manage over 50 hives by myself, which, by the way, it's a lot of work. And uh, I get into it, but my whole thing is beekeeping, it's not the honey. Uh, it's the act of beekeeping. And I found, when I had those two hives, I found it extremely healthy. When I came from work, and I was stressed, and I would just sit in front of the hive, I'm weird too, by the way, and I would watch what's happening in front of the hive. The bees are flying in and out, and what they are doing, what they bring. They bring dead bodies, they don't let drones in, and so on. So I found it really interesting, and I found it very relaxed. And then comes the act of you open the hive and you take the frame out and you have bees flying all around and I found you have to focus on the act. You cannot think about problems at work because you are part of the nature. You are part of the hive. I found it extremely relaxing. So that was my whole thing. And that's what we're gonna talk about. Well, then as I said, I took the course and a few years back I took the course at the university and I got my Master Beekeeper certification, which, by the way, doesn't mean much. I just learned a lot of genetics and DNA and RNA and all of that. Uh, but I would like to basically spread the knowledge and kind of tell you what you, as a maybe beekeeper, when you want to start, what you shouldn't do, what you should do. And that will really help you get over disappointments. So, that's basically my think about the beekeeping, why I do it, and why you should do it. But first, before I really go into it, I'll ask you a question. What do you think is the first question people always ask me when they find out I, I do beekeeping? 
Sorry? Yeah, you get stuck. That's other thing. That's a, that, that's not the first question, but sometimes people do. I have to say, bees don't want to sting you. They die. They are actually very peaceful. You pick the uh, right day, right time to open them. They are okay, and you can. Our bees are gentle. That's what we want, right? And but you will get stung if you are highly allergic to beekeeping. Forget about it. Uh, make a friend with some beekeeper so you know who they are. And every time I got stung, it's my fault. I did something wrong. If I am calm, they are calm. If I squeeze the bee, she will. One time, I had a pants like this. I was doing beekeeping. Bee got in my legs. And I'm standing there. And guys, you will probably understand. I feel bee is in my underpants. Right there. And I'm like, OK, so I cannot drop everything. So. I finished what I did, I walked away, it was probably another 10 minutes, she didn't sting me. Wow. I was happy too. Yeah. And from that time on, when I am in a rush, I don't have time, I use socks, which I put on top of my pants, because I don't want to be in my underpants ever again. <laughs> I felt very insecure. Yeah. Okay. All right. No, what's the first question? Think. What would you ask beekeeper first? Okay, I'll help you because you don't have much time. Usually, first question, how much honey do you get? And it's always surprising. It's like, if you want to have a bees on your backyard because of the honey, that's a wrong reason to have a bees. You are better off to have, again, make a friend with a beekeeper and buy the honey from them. Because you will not, you will get some honey, but there's a lots of work. Unless you really enjoy that work around bees and doing that, then you are better off to get the honey somewhere else. So answer your question, average production in North America, it's around 113 pounds of honey per hive. That's average. You get more honey, which is surprising, you get more honey, more north you go. So highest production of honey in the world is Alberta, Canada, and north part of Alberta, Canada. And it's actually very easy to understand. Those bees there, if there are local bees, they know they have seven months of winter. So you give them empty boxes, and they'll fill it, because they know they have to survive seven months. If you have bees in Hawaii, they know they can get nectar any day. They have two, three frames of honey, and they stop bringing honey. They're like, what do I need it for, right? Oh, wait, I need the next picture, please. Yeah. Uh oh, I'm wired, but wire isn't working. Oh, I'm bouncing. You're a bouncing boy. I know. That's what. It's not working. Whoops. <laughs> I'm okay. Are you okay? Sorry, I'm having difficulty. Here we go. Get that back up. All right. That's the one. Oh, hey, don't worry about it much now. Just, I'm going to tell you what's happening. Maybe. I broke it again. So, so what's happening in the hive? I'm going to be very quick. We really don't have much time. Uh, by the way, I teach courses as well. And we will be here all day. So if you have more questions, you can come and ask questions. OK, in the hive, how many bees is in the hive? Over winter, probably 10,000, right? They make it. If you have a really good hive over summer, then maybe 50, 60, 80,000 bees in the hive. In one hive? One hive. There is three bees in the hive. And this is kind of interesting, only three bees. There is worker, and I will show you a picture. We will look at a picture later. There is worker, that's the female. And guys, don't take it wrong, but she does all the work. <laughs> she does everything. They live around four to six weeks in summer. They basically work themselves to death. They just, they never stop working. We get born, she starts working the same in five minutes. Somehow she knows. There is no teenagers in bees. They just know. We don't have to tell them. They do communicate. So bees goes from cleaning the cell, feeding the brood, uh, 
doing all the work in the hive, taking that bees out to guarding the hive and bringing the pollen and nectar. That's the kind of cycle, and then they die. So that's worker bee. She does everything. Then there is queen. There is only one queen in the hive. She's a female, and she's special, and her only job is to lay eggs. And she lays a lots of eggs. In summer, let's say June, when they really grow, she would lay around 3,000 eggs a day. It's incredible. That's all she does, lays her eggs, lays eggs. She gets out of hive usually only once in the life. And that's when, after she gets born, a few days later, she flies out to mate. And then she flies back, and that's it. And she never gets out again, usually. Unless she swarms, but let's say she doesn't swarm. So that's a queen. So it's kind of boring job, really. And the name is queen, but she has nothing to do with majesty, guys. Like, she has no say in the whole hive. It's all workers. They make decision. It's a true female run. True feminism is in the hive, guys. Like, they do everything. So, what Queen does, her first job is when she gets born, she's a virgin. She gets born, and she gets out of her little cell, and first thing, she has to find any other queens or queen cells, and she has to kill them. Because if she doesn't, she will get killed. So her first job is to get out of the cell, go in, find a cell. If there is a cell, she will make a hole and kill the little queen in there. And if there is other queen, they will fight, and one of them will win. And the one which will win will then have a privilege of flying out and mate, and have kind of orgy with 20 drones or so. And then she comes back. And then for the whole life, she lays eggs. She doesn't lay many eggs in the winter, right, because they don't grow, but she lays eggs in summer a lot. The other guy, and I said guy in the hive. How long does the queen live? She could live after up to four or five years, but now beekeeping, and this, we don't have time for this, but beekeeping gets so commercialized that queens which you buy now will not last four years. They sometimes don't even last one season because there is artificial insemination and genetics is wrong and so on. So, but in the old times, four or five years, one queen. But there is other bee, and it's a drone. It's the only male in the hive. And guys, they have an amazing life. They do nothing, absolutely nothing. Their whole purpose in the life is to mate with a virgin queen. And that's the only drive they have. They are kind of stupid because they think that there may be better queen in somewhere else, so they leave the hive. So drones don't really belong to one hive. They go from hive to hive, they try to find a better mating partner somewhere else. And they really do nothing. They only feed themselves, they eat. They do no work and they just enjoy, they suntan, they go out, they come back. Is there a virgin? No, I'll wait. But guys, don't get too excited, it's not so great. Because when they mate with the queen, it is a big orgy, there is like 20 of them mating with the queen they all die. She kind of makes it sound good. She lures them in, they do their job, and then she leaves with their genitals as well. So they all die. Those happy ones who mate, they have this moment of glory and then they die. And the rest of them, they fly back and they have a hope again. Well, it wouldn't sound so bad, really, but then what happens in the fall, bees are smart, and I mean workers. They know drones are kind of leeches, like we really don't need them. So in the fall, they don't want to feed them, they don't want to lose their honey. So these drones, as I said, they get out of the hive. But they go back in the evening, and it's the saddest thing to see in the evening. You have these 10, 20 drones line up on the entrance of the hive, and they want to get in. But workers won't let them in. And they just stand there and wait and wait. And and you find them in the morning dead on the entrance. And the bees get out and pick the drone and fly and drop him. Just, OK, let's get out of it. And that's what happens. And they make new drones in the spring. 
I can go into it how to make drones and whatever, but that's too much. Before we go ahead, I'll show you a picture. So on the top, that's the queen. You see she is long, she has a long body, and the reason for the long body is so she can put her butt in the cell and put the egg in there, right? And when she is born as a virgin, she's not as big because she is not full of eggs and sperm, right? Well, after she flies, she goes back and she grows and she lays eggs. She really cannot fly well because she's too heavy, too big. That's the worker. Oh, no, that's the drone. Drone is almost the same size as queen. Sometimes it's difficult to recognize, but after you know, you know. They have a hairy butt, kind of, and squarish. They have a big eyes pointing up. Reason for that is when they mate, drones fly down, queens fly above. They have to see up, right? So that their eyes are big and pointing up. You can see, right? So that's the reason. Again, their only purpose is mating. They are made for that. The beautiful part about drones is they don't have a stinger. They cannot sting you. So if you ever do something, and we do it a lot with children, I can recognize the drone. I will pick the drone, and I will tell them, this is Joe. And Joe flies in and out, and I know Joe, and he is, doesn't sting, he's trained, and kids can hold the drone in the hand, and I can put it in the mouth, and they are shocked, and they have a good story. And I can give them drones in the little box, and they can bring it home, and it's amazing, and they can release them at home. So drone, don't sting. Don't make mistake. Queen can sting, but she usually doesn't. I handled hundreds and hundreds of queens, and I never got stung, and I handled them in my bare hands. And this is a worker, right? That picture there is the cell. So you see the egg. Then the egg becomes like a larva, you see, and it's in many stages. And then bees will cut it. And that's little bug here, that's varroa mite. That's the mite you probably heard about. You heard about colony collapse and so on. There is many issues with it. But varroa mite, that's the real size compared to the bee, right? Real scale. So it would be like a, uh, like a ball on me. This would be the size on me if I'm the bee. It's quite big. And bee, she cannot take it off because it's usually somewhere she cannot do it. There are some bees, like Russian bees, which they clean themselves. But with that comes aggression as well, and we don't have time to talk about it. So that's that, and that little bug on the bottom, that's called small hive beetle, which is a big issue in the United States. It's amazing how everything spreads fast. All of these parasites come from Asia, and but they spread so fast that it's unbelievable. It's just unreal how fast things happen. Uh, the hive beetle didn't make it to Canada yet in the big, we had some cases in Vancouver, because of the, they say because of the winter. It's, but it, it is in Montana, varroa is everywhere. So now I go back to bees. So honeybees, that's Apis mellifera, that's Latin. And what Latin it means, it means that they gather honey, they collect the honey. There is around 20,000 bees in the world. Almost 1,000 kinds of bees in North America. Only 23 species of honeybees. The difference between all the other bees and honey, uh, all the bees and honeybees is that honeybees made a decision that they're gonna make it through the winter. They are not gonna die, they're gonna make it. So they collect honey. All other bees do not collect honey and nectar. So what they do, they collect honey and pollen and store it in the hive. And the idea why they do it is, oh, we're gonna have six months winter so we're gonna eat that honey, which is energy, that's sugar, right? With enzymes and all that good stuff. And, and, and pollen, which is protein. And we're gonna keep our queen alive whole winter because we're gonna make a cluster around the queen and we're gonna keep her warm. Very interesting fact is the cluster of the bees, temperature inside is the same temperature as a human body temperature. Very interesting, right? Bees do have heart, and they do have blood, which is interesting too. And other interesting fact, people always confuse fly and bee. Well, there's many bees, as I told you. Bees have four wings. Flies have only two wings. 
So if you ever see some insect you are not sure, look, do it have four wings or two? If it's four, it's a bee. It may not be honeybee. Other bees, like bumblebee, I'll give example, how they survive winter is in the fall, they just make 20 queens. And they all die except those 20 queens, which fly somewhere and they find some spot, crack, usually underground, and they hide there. And they hope they're going to make it. In the spring, let's say from 20, two will make it. They get out, they build a colony. And that's how the cycle works. So they don't need the honey, right? Do you know, do you think honeybees were here in North America always? No, never. You probably heard natives used to do this with honey and honeybees. It's, I don't want to be rude, but it's not true. Honeybees came with well, who discovered America? Columbus. After Columbus, honey came from Europe. I mean, honey, bees came from Europe. And now bees, people will ask you, do you have Italian bees, German bees, Carnolian, Russian, and there is all these, this and that. What they did in Europe, they really tried to breed only German, only Russian, only Italian. In North America, it's very interesting what happened. We are all kind of mutts. We kind of, everything is mixed here. The same happened with bees. It's basically almost impossible to buy pure German bee. And the reason is bee is mating, right, with drones. You cannot tell the bee, queen, no, 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 don't make with this drone, that's Italian. No, 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 you are German, no, no. They mate with anything. So what happened in North America, we have bees which have all the genetics. And the, it's actually good. Now, Europeans are importing North American bees because they are much better, healthier, they do much, they produce more honey because they are all mixed, right? And I can talk about bees days, and, but I have to, I have only like 45 minutes, so I, I cannot really do many details. So, that's, I just want you to know about bees. The very interesting thing for you as a, you're gonna, if you want to do beekeeping, typically will be just what I did, right? You buy the package, throw it in. You will buy the package, these bees will probably come from California or New Zealand, right? They are probably not, well, not probably, they are not bees good for Montana, for sure not. Bees in New Zealand never saw the seven months or six months of snow. You need bees which are local. <coughs> My best advice to you would be start with bees from the local beekeeper. And by local, I mean there's many local beekeepers, but their bees are right now in Arizona pollinating almonds. Those are not local bees. They bring them here for the honey. You need bees which winterize here. Because if that's the real genetics. So people are buying these packages from south usually. And then after a year or two, they die. And, and it's a vicious circle. And usually, I'll give you just two kind of bees, Italian, German. Italian, amazing honey producer. They build huge cluster, huge hives. They bring lots of honey. They are gentle, and they are kind of brownish, beautiful bees, and everybody wants them. German bees, they are dark. Uh, they don't bring so much honey, but they winterize very well. Italians don't winterize very well. Kind of makes sense, right? Italy, well, southern Italy, it's kind of nice. It's like California. Interesting is when they do genetics, they bring samples from bees all over North America. And they found that in genetics that the more north you go, there is more Italian genetics. The more south you go, it's more German. It's a mystery. But I'll give you a quick answer for it. What's happening, if you are in the north, you get the package, it dies, you buy a new package, so there is much more Italian bees coming into the north because they don't make it over winter. So we replace them, again, it's a wrong bees, and we do that over and over and over. Well, 30 years later, you end up with more Italian genetics in north than in south, right? Mother nature. It's really shocking. So that would be my thing for bees, make sure you get the local bees. 
Okay. So now for the bees, you all heard about bees dying, right? You heard like, oh my God, co-ops, colony, whatever. You know, it's terrible. But what you hear sometimes, it may not be really true. And I'll tell you, I kind of tried to touch on it, why. Uh, you have bees flying all over. And so you have commercial beekeepers and you have hobby beekeepers. Hobby beekeeping is now huge. It's incredible, like it's, it's a big trend. And I think hobby beekeepers can really save bees. I really believe that. Commercial beekeepers, I'll go back to commercial, and I hope there is no commercial beekeeper here, because they will shoot me probably. For them, bees is what? Money. It's money, right? So they have no time to do like when you have two hives on the backyard to enjoy and really take care of your girls and so on. You, they don't call them girls, it's money. So what they do, they have thousands of hives and they need to maximize the profit. And how they maximize the profit is they winterize them in the south and you saw these big trucks and they move them from first they start right now, they are probably basically pollinating almonds, right? And then they move them more north, north, and then in summer they end up here for honey. And then they move them again. And then they sell bees, which is drastic how they do it, how they shake it, but you. For them to do that, they don't have time to do organic thing for bees and tree things. They don't have time. They use chemicals. And guys, it's incredible how we solve the problems. So we know there is a mind, right? Everybody knows that. Well, the best solution was to take the poison which was developed for Second World War and we make it in these little plastic strips and we put it in the hive. And some scientists were probably paid by producers of those scale. Oh, if it's in the hive only for weeks and if it's not during the honey production, that's not a problem at all. And I will say, yeah, 40 years ago we were spraying kids with DDT and we thought it's great. So what they do, they put it in the hive and they take it out four weeks later. And they say, it's perfect, it's no problem. When you take it out, you need special gloves. You cannot throw it in the garbage, it's illegal. You have to put it in a special bag and it has to go to special collection. Is it happening? I don't think so, but it's supposed to. And the problem is with the chemical, it's not just killing mites, but the chemicals are in your hive. And if someone tells me, oh, if you don't have a honey, there, it's not a problem. I don't buy it because that chemical gets in your wood, it gets in your box, and it's in the hive and the bee, bees will spread it around. It will get in your honey, and it will get in your box. But it's such a small taste, ah, that's okay. There are organic ways to treat it. The problem is with mite, they got used to it. They now kind of like, oh, and you have to do it twice a year, and. Even that doesn't work. So, and they put more and more in it, right? So that's one chemical bees have to deal with. The other chemical, you all know, probably Monsanto, right? We now have these brilliant seeds. You don't have to even spray them. You just, it just grows and pesticides are already in the plant. And they do research and say, okay, bee lands on it and it's okay. It's, that's so minimal. But no one tells you that bee goes maybe on 500, 1,000 plants a day. And then she comes back to the hive, brings it back. She gets this perfect mixture of poison, right? In the hive, brings it over from outside. Everybody, or well, everybody, many people hate dandelions. That's the first great, great source of nectar and pollen for bees. Well, municipality and people spray with Roundup. Well, the bees land on it, bring it in, and then you have a poison hive. And it's, guys, it's amazing. You come to the hive next day and they are all dead. And, oh, that's colony collapse. Well, we do that. Uh, so, commercial beekeepers, hobby beekeepers. If I have a neighbor and a neighbor, and it could be three miles, bees do fly three miles and more. So it doesn't have to be neighbor right beside you. I have a beast and I treat for mites and I do my best to keep them healthy. If there is a neighbor two miles and it's this natural beekeeper, I'm not touching them, I'm leaving everything and they make it fine if they don't. That diseases from that hive will come to my hive. Because who do you think spreads the diseases? 
Who flies from Hive to Hive? I already told you that. Drone, the guys, like, oh, if you wouldn't have a guys, life would be so much easier. <laughs> so, so they fly from Hive to Hive, right? And they bring the diseases over. So you can do, I have to tell you, like last year, I brought 10 hives from Canada. They were inspected. It's very, very difficult to bring bees from Canada, not hives. Uh, they were inspected in Canada. They were inspected on the border. You have to have a lab. It's crazy paperwork. We did it. There were no mites. They would not let, even if they found one mite, it's not going over. We installed them here in Kalispo. Within a month, we had like disaster mites. I was like, this is crazy. This. But there is so many hobby beekeepers around. So hobby beekeepers can save bees, but they could be actually a problem too. You really need to be educated. You need to understand the biology. And if you understand the biology and what's going on the hive, it's not so complicated, guys. It's actually very easy. So that's that. Can I have the next picture, please? Yes. Well, I have a good story for this. Actually, the whole picture idea was that he's naked. He's not naked. He does have, and you can see on that. I was trying to Photoshop him as, ah, no, I'll leave it. So the story is, bees, you can breed bees for many, well, only few actually things. Honey production, right? That's what commercial beekeepers want. They want honeybees which will produce a lots of honey. Or they will pollinate. So they need them to grow fast in the spring, which is tied with uh, honey production. Or you can breed them for gentleness, right? Or you can breed them for disease resistance. And that's basically it or good winterizing, right? So those are for every backyard beekeeper wants what? Gentle bees, because we all see these pictures and YouTube videos of the guys like basically like him, opening hive and like, oh my God, and you feel, guys, it's possible, but it has to be right day, right time of the day, you have to understand what's going on the hive and it has to be gentle hive. Uh, it's possible, but if you are a beginner beekeeper, don't try it in the beginning. Just suit up, you will be more confident, you will feel more in line with bees because you won't be worried about being stuck. And be gentle, be calm, it's amazing, it's a meditation. For me, it's meditation. It's relaxed, it's like yoga, trust me. So, story with this guy is, you have, oh, you have to find the right balance. If I have really gentle bees, which are like they don't care about anything, they will not make it either. Because they are gentle to you, they are gentle to anything else. So if the wasps, yellow jackets, decide to attack your hive, if you have a gentle, gentle bees, they will just, okay, oh, okay, kill me. If you have an aggressive bees, wasps will not make it. So there's a fine balance, right? The same with honey production and so on. So story with this guy is, this guy lived in my place for a few months and he's highly, highly allergic to bees because his grandpa was a doctor in Europe and he had 10 hives, but they were European vicious bees. So every time the kids would walk by the hives, they got stuck. And this guy really hated them and then he developed allergy. Well. He lived in my place and he saw me working bees. And one day, again, it was a beautiful day. It was sunny, blue sky, hot, and at lunchtime. What happens? All the all bees are out. They are not in the hive. They are looking for the nectar, bringing it back, right? So that's the best time to open the hive. So I worked them, and they were extremely gentle. So I said, Michael, come here. So first he was suited, and he's like, these are not like bees, this is amazing. I said, let's make a picture for your mom. <laughs> Get naked, and, and he's like, I don't know. I said, yeah, let's do it, and he did it. <laughs> he, he does have a smile, but I can tell you guys, he's not so comfortable. But he didn't get stuck. Bees were flying all over him, and he is holding the frame. We send the picture to his mom, and she got, like, she was in shock, because she's like, oh my God, like, it stank like you have to go to hospital and so on but she was so I just want to show you this as a joke that you can have bees like this I found out myself I start with two hives when you have two hives and you should start with two don't start with one start with two and I can tell you later why 
you have time. And the problem with hobby beekeeper is you really enjoy it and you want to come there almost every week to check the hive. I, it, it's not bad, but it's better probably every two weeks in summer. But if it makes you happy, why not? But I found that if you have two hives, you have time. And you get ready and you really take it as something fun, something nice to do. If you have ten hives, guys, it's become, it becomes work. It becomes too much. It becomes a job. So there is a fine line. I would suggest two hives. Okay? So now I will, what time is it? Um, 10.39. Oh, I still have time. So what we do, and we are here, we do beekeeping, and we have now hives all over here. We have hives at uh, Lower Valley Farm, uh, Mandy and Jay, and they'll be doing presentation here. It's an organic farm. And we have two hives close to Conrad mentioned, which we use for therapy. Alison is a therapist, and she is taking clients to the hive and use that as a therapy. It's kind of a new concept. Uh, we try to do it. It's a non-profit company. And uh, the other hives we have on the other side of Kalispo. Uh, we do hive maintenance. We do therapy. All profits go to program, you need to buy equipment and so on, and I can tell you about it more if you see me at the booth. Uh, the, this, is, this is just a fun picture, and we change the, what we do because I do everything light now, because I found even myself, and I, I consider myself quite fit, but I have to say, if you have a full-size box, which Tamara is here, they have the full-size boxes, nothing wrong with it, guys. But full-size box with 10 frames of full of honey, it's probably like 60 to 80 pounds. I mean, I am strong, but after doing this five times, I'm like, I don't want to do that. It's too heavy. So we switched. We have everything smaller, so it's manageable, and do it a little bit different. Uh, the, we are always looking for volunteers. So if you want to learn beekeeping, you can just give us a call and come, and I will more than happy to take you and teach you and and it's I don't pay but it's free you are learning we are teaching classes as well and so that's all for the bees and now I will open it to the questions and you can ask any question you want I will try to be as politically correct as possible and I will answer anything I can for you yeah I agree. When, no, so, so when we yeah. buy a hive then does it come with a queen or do our bees grow a queen? No, if you buy the hive, just the hive, you get no queen. But if you buy the package, right, which comes from somewhere, there is a queen. The only problem is that queen, that queen is probably made from artificial insemination and it's a sister of under 10,000 queens and you are not getting right genetic. Uh, so you have an option to get a package and then requeen with a local queen you get from local beekeeper or from us. And, but uh, if you buy the package of bees, they always come with a key. You can make you, you know, it's not sustainable to buy packages and queens. Not at all. Once you have one or two hives going, you can make, you can grow if you want. If that's, if your intention will be first few years to grow to 20 hives, if that's what you want, and don't worry about honey, you can do that. You can make splits, right? You, it's easy, it's, you just pull the hives, you do it. And they make their own queen if you want to, but they, they do come with, but if you buy just the equipment, it doesn't come with the hive. What we do, we supply the hive, bees, everything, you own the equipment, and you sign the contract with us for a year, we maintain the hive for you, you are free to come and learn. I will let you know I'm coming to do the bees, you can be with me, we can go over it, you can call me, ask the questions, and I really suggest that's the way to go, because I really find out it was very hard to find a mentor. And again, it's a for, for good cause, it's all going to the program. You had a question. How do you organically control the mites? There are a few ways, many ways, many ways. I tried them all. Okay. So one, sugar, you take the, if you know you have a mite, you have to control them. And I can show you on the hive there how to know if you have a mite problem or not. You have a powder sugar, 
you open the hive and you spray kind of drop the sugar on. The idea is bees start cleaning themselves from the sugar, mites get covered in the sugar and they fall from the hive if you have a screen bar. I think it works some, but it's not really so great. The other one, there is organic thing, which is oxalic acid, which is in our food, and formic acid, which is ant produced that, right? Formic acid, you use that. That kills the, uh, that kills the mites, and it's organic. The other one is thymol, which is, again, organic thing. There are many ways you can control it, but it's more work, and commercial beekeepers will never do it. There's no way. Because if you do, if you do it organic, you have to come to hive back maybe in two days and one week. Organic uh, commercial beekeeper, they want to put it in and leave because they they cannot do that. But there are ways, and I can tell you more about it. And one thing I want to tell you: organic honey. I see it all over the place, guys, and I always have to laugh because, or I'm puzzled how they get certification. The reason is, I already told you, bees fly three to five miles to get the nectar. Unless you are in completely middle of nowhere, there is nothing around, there is no agriculture around you, that I don't think I can claim I have an organic honey. I can tell you in our hives, we do not use any chemicals. So, can I say it's organic? No, because I don't know where the bee flew to get the nectar. I can't control that. And Honey business is huge business, and there's a lot of fraud going on. I'll give you just an example. You probably all heard about honey from New Zealand, Manuka honey, right? It's supposed to be very healthy. It's very expensive for no reason, really. But it's like $25 for this little jar. It's supposed to have a healing properties and so on. So New Zealand, that's the only place they, they get it. And they, comp they know how many they produce, how many barrels, let's say, right, of honey. And they, they record it for years. So they know that their average production per year is around 18,000 barrels a year of the manuka honey. And then they found out that just in England, just in one country, 25,000 barrels of manuka honey is sold every year. And I mean, you look at numbers, it's like, we produce 80, and just one country sells 25, and we still sell manuka honey. New Zealand, Australia, US, all over Europe, Canada. Something's not jiving here, right? Something's not working. Honey business is not controlled. You can buy honey here in Costco. I'll give you another example. One year I had lots of honey. So I sell two buckets of honey to the big wholesale guy, a company in Canada. Be made, you probably heard of them, doesn't matter. And I go to Costco and they pay me three dollars for pound of honey. Three dollars for pound. I go to Costco and I see be made organic Canadian honey, which I'm how they how can they say organic? Like I mean they get honey from hundred beekeepers and mix it, right? But whatever. And the price was for four pounds. Eleven dollars. How I this something is wrong, right? That's even less that they would buy from me. And plus Costco get the margin, right? They probably get hundred percent margin. And I'm like, so I phone them. And I said, Well, you know, just for interest, I don't really care, but how is it possible? Well, you know, like we process the honey. I'm like, well, what do you mean you process the honey? And they said, Well, it's you know, we we dilute it and we mix it and blah 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 and goes through filters and I'm like, well, but you say it's 100% uh, Canadian, no, they didn't say organic, sorry, 100% Canadian pure honey. How can you say pure if you just told me that you are putting in corn syrup? And she, he's like, well, you have to read what it says on the label. It says 100% Canadian pure honey. So the 100% is applied to Canadian, not to pure. I'm like, oh, we are a lawyer writing the label. <laughs> so, I don't know what was the question. <laughs> okay, next question. Uh, if we have friends that used to have yeah. and they offered to give us their hives or their boxes that have been sitting there for a few years, is that a bad idea? Are they good friends? <laughs> Would they tell you what happened with the hive? 
Yes. You okay. Have so I would say, do not buy used equipment if you do not know the person very well you are buying it from. Because you may buy problem, right? There is different diseases you have to treat with antibiotics and so on. I will answer your question. In, uh, you, you can treat with antibiotics. You buy used equipment, you don't know what you are getting. There are ways to disinfect it. It's complicated. I would say if it's good friend, their bees didn't die of some disease or whatever, go for it. But if they are early. Get it inspected. Get someone to look at it who understands. I mean, that doesn't guarantee that someone will know, but at least you, you can disinfect it. And again, I can tell you how. It's possible. It's not ideal. I, I probably, if I wouldn't know the people very well, I would probably go for it. If you use used equipment and it's good, you have a head start because bees love it. They love the wax, it's all kind of ready for them. They will build the hive much faster than if you just put the wool. So, more questions? Yeah? Do you your bees here? Yes, we do. Well, this is, I, will, I overwinter bees in North Alberta, and we brought them here, here. Winter in Alberta is much colder than here, but it's drier. We get a lot, of, it's very cold. It's not the cold which kills your bees. It's the moisture, right? It depends on the configuration of the hive, and I play with it, I can explain it to you there. Uh, what I do, I insulate them on outside not much, and I make a special insulation on the top. And the reason is so the moisture doesn't stay in the hive and it doesn't drop on the bees. And that's the only thing I really do. I have a screen bottom, so there is a ventilation on the bottom, which I did close this year here, and I'm just experimenting what will work here and what will not. So we'll see what happens. So far, all our hives are alive. The problem by, by bees die over winter I had bees die over winter, very few, but I did. And every time they died, I knew in the fall that they, I mean, that they will die. I just didn't want to accept it. So I said, oh, I'm gonna do this and that. But I already knew that hive is big, and the best thing for me to do would be to cancel that hive and shake the bees to other hive, make one hive strong. And then in the spring, I can make three hives from that strong hive, right? But that hive doesn't do anything for me. So. It's you as a beekeeper who usually make a wrong decision, kind of, oh, I'm gonna try, and I feed them lots of sugar water. Uh, you may, they may survive or they may not. Some commercial beekeepers don't even winterize bees because it costs them 60 pounds of honey, so they do the math. Well, I can sell the honey and I can buy the bees in the spring. They kill them. That's how capitalists we are. I wouldn't do it as a hobby beekeeper. Next question. Yeah. Um, what do mites do? Mites? Okay, they are like parasites. They don't really kill bees. They just sit on them and they suck their blood. And then when the bee queen lays the egg and it's a larva, how they reproduce, that one mite goes in the cell and she lays little mites, little eggs with the, with the larva. And as the larva grow, these little mites eat their food as well and they get born with the little bee and they jump on other bees and that's a cycle. If you understand the cycle, you can actually control it. But how the mites kill bees is that mites spread diseases. They are full of diseases and what they do, they suck the blood, right? So they bite it. So it's like, it's like mosquitoes. It's like let's say you would have a constant mosquito on you and they will bite you, but mosquito is sick and it's giving you sickness in the blood. The same. Uh, there are other diseases. Did it answer your question? There is other diseases which you have a choice as beekeeper. And I hate antibiotics. I hate to even take it myself. But you have to be realistic. If you get some disease which only treatment is antibiotic, you have a choice to make. And the choice is you kill the hive or let them die or you treat them with antibiotics. And I hate to do that, but if you have to do that, I mean, that's the choice you make. It's like you have a child, and child has a 
bad sickness, need antibiotic. Are you going to decide, oh no, I'm going to let him fight it? If you know that antibiotic works, nobody wants to give your child antibiotic, right? But you do it because that's the cure. I think there is an extreme. Commercial beekeepers, they don't even know if their bees are dead. Twice a year, they'll give them antibiotic. I'm not kidding you guys. Twice a year, they'll treat them with antibiotics, right? Just do it. You don't have to. You have to treat only when you have to. I think we are running out of time. One um, more question. It's a two-part question. In Eureka area where I live, we have big ant piles. Yeah. And that's all formic acid on the top. Nothing grows in it. Mm -hmm. It's an insect repellent and mm -hmm. all kinds of mm -hmm. repellent that I use in my garden. Yeah. Would that be good to sprinkle on top of no, the pile? No. Won't do anything. And the other question is about thyme oil. I know my essential oil thyme has thyme oil in it. Yeah. So uh, would I just put that on a, a strip in the hive or what? I, you probably could, but there is a product you buy. It's completely organic. It's a little the yellow pads. And you put it in the hive and bees chew it over time. But that's the same thing. I think sometimes we try to do many things by ourselves, and someone already did the research. The problem, even with formic acid, is how long it's there, how strong it is. And you, someone did that, right? So formic acid, if it's too strong, it will kill your bees as well. It will make your drones impotent. They cannot have babies, right? It will make kill your bee, make, make kill your queen. So it's, someone did that, right? That's why I think you need a mentor. You really need someone to help you. I was hoping someone's going to ask me a question about flow frames. About what? Flow frames. It's a new thing from Australia, and that's the last thing, and I'm going to have to go, I think. Flow frames, you probably all heard about it. Two, three years ago, I was bombarded by my friends who knew I would be keeping. They sent me links of this flow, and I was looking at it, and I was skeptical, but I'm like, okay, I don't want to be the old guy who doesn't want to see new things, I'm like, okay, maybe, I, not for me, I don't see it, whatever. And I think those guys, it's a father and son in Australia, they did amazing market, amazing. They needed $70,000, they put it on the website, in two days they got $2.4 million. Now they are $13 million. You don't need that kind of money for anything, you really like the beekeeping, but they got it. It's and I kind of don't want to say anything about it negative because I don't really know, but I was skeptical and there are many reasons I can tell you about it more later. One thing I want to tell you, last weekend, one of our friends bought it. It's over $600 for six frames, or seven frames, which goes in one box. Which when she told me, I was like, what? You paid this much? We took one, I want to see it, so I took one out, and I didn't bend it, I just, and it all flew apart. Guys, there was a hundred pieces all over. And I'm like, okay, so if this happens, when you work bees, you are done. You are, you are walking away. And so my thing is, instead of spending $600 on the frames, $650, then all the boxes, you're going to be around $850 just for the hive. Now you have to buy the bees, let's say it's $200, you are over $1,000. I think you are much better off to hire us to do maintenance for you, to supply the bees, to, to give you honey, to mentor you for the year, and you will be much better off than having those friends. That's, I think, it. So I sell myself, I hope. So you can be like that. <laughs>